So I'm not going to spend any time on introductions. I assume at least the Columbia Business School students I know know how to read. So um, I teach at Columbia Business School. I can say that much for my students. Um, so we're not going to do any, any time introductions. We really want to just get into the meat of this and very excited to have everyone here. We have a great panel today that are going to really offer quite intentionally three different perspectives on the question of social metrics. And I'm hoping as much as we can, I know them and they're all far too nice, um, but I am hoping that we can have a bit of a provocative conversation about what really is ultimately the utility of social metrics and how are they going to make a difference in all of us being able to put our time, talents and money to work to change social problems at a different pace and scale. Uh, before I get to the panel, just very briefly wanted to um, sort of set up this context of social metrics. I'm always surprised by how interested people at conferences like this are in social metrics. Um, and I wouldn't even say, I think the phrase social metrics is a bit, um, you know, even more technical. To me, the question we're really answering is how do we measure social impact? So when we talk about investment funds or nonprofits who are trying to use investment capital to generate both profits and f social return, or even a nonprofit that's focused on creating social good, how do we measure that? And I have sort of two sort of you know, images I want to leave with you before we go to the panel to sort of explain why I think this is such an important uh, uh, topic. The first was from last year's Social Enterprise Conference. Was anyone here uh, for the Social Metrics panel? Um, the two things I remember about the panel, the one was it was the first one in the morning. I think it was like 8.30 in the morning. Bruce Springsteen had played Giant Stadium the night before. Um, and he rocked harder than anyone should ever expect to rock. And so I came in and I was exhausted. That's one, the one thing I remember. <laughs> But the other thing I remember was we had someone from the IGNIA fund here, and that's a impact investing fund based in Mexico. And he spent, my students heard this story uh, this week in class, but the rest of you, uh, he spent you know, 10 minutes describing the fact that this is an investment fund. They've raised $102 million, and they are putting their money to work in companies who are going to grow and enrich the investors, that's the intent, but who also are providing basic services to poor people. These are companies that are providing health care to poor people, uh, better housing, and are enabling farmers to participate in higher value agribusiness chains. And everyone, it was 8.30 in the morning and everyone was kind of falling asleep. And then someone raised their hand and said, so that's great, but what are your financial returns? And he said, we're targeting 20 to 25% IRRs. And suddenly everyone woke up. <laughs> and it struck me that the most inspiring and exciting thing that he had been talking about was the social impact his fund would have. But because he didn't have the language to quantify that in the form of a number, and to express not only the number, but to express it in a way that allowed his audience to understand how that number was benchmarked against others, there was no way to inspire the audience and get people to wake up. The number 20 to 25% IRRs, it is a standard measure. He says the word IRR and everyone in the room knows what he means. And in our minds, we know that that is good. And we have benchmarks. For the social return, all he had was stories. So that was one. Um, one thing that struck me, and, and the other one was uh, two weeks ago, if anyone here was at the Clinton Global Initiative, there was an hour-long debate between Mohammed Yunus and Vikram Akula, who has just uh, had an IPO of SKS Microfinance in India, which is now a public li publicly listed company worth more than a billion dollars. And the debate was really about who is having greater social impact. Mohammed Yunus, who runs the world's most famous nonprofit microfinance institution, or Vikram Akula, who now has 7 million customers and runs the largest MFI in India and the fastest growing one. And so, again, it struck me that if we had Vikram Pandit and Lloyd Blankfein up here and we had a debate who is making, who is doing better, Citibank or Goldman, we wouldn't have to discuss that for an hour. They would each say, well, here are our audited financial statements from last year and here is our shareholder returns and I won't say what order they would walk out the door in, but they would walk out the door and be done. Um, and so again, I think both of those, that's another image that struck me as an example of why social metrics are so important. So I don't have this on a slide, but I'm going to try, for those of you who can see, a lot of you have seen um, this HSBC campaign. It's an image of a guy in a suit and a guy in jeans, and he's follower, leader, leader, <coughs> follower. So Jake Samuelson from the, the Global Impact Investing Network has improved on the concept. And here is Mohammed Yunus and Vikram Akula, and who is the impact investor and who is the impact imposter? And I would argue that without social metrics, we just don't know. So I hope that the rest of the panel can say whether I'm crazy or not. And if I'm not crazy, what are we going to do about getting to the point where the guy from Ignea Fund and Mohammed Yunus can stand up here and convey the power of what they're doing in ways that are as compelling as simply saying what their IRRs are. Um, so I just wanted to 
set that up and then turn to Sarah Gelfand, who is the person who runs Iris. And the, the back of the shirt says, if, how do we know about who's an impact investor, who's an impact imposter? Well, if you've got social metrics, you'll know. And Iris is a system that is trying to create something equivalent to IRRR or other standard measures. So Sarah, I just wanted you to describe a little bit why it is you do what you do, what it is that you do, and why do you think it's going to make a difference? Sure. I, oh, it's on. Okay. Um, so I work at the Global Impact Investing Network, which is an organization that has a mandate to increase the effectiveness of the impact investing industry. And I think standards and the development of standards for social metrics and environmental metrics are one of the key tools that we build as, as an organization in support of that. And largely because of everything you just said, that you know, the industry as a whole is really limited in its ability to scale without the credible, useful, verifiable information about these other dimensions of the performance of social businesses and social funds. And um, <laughs> I think basically in the financial space, allocation decisions about resources and capital are made based on numbers and based on data. And though data is not a complete representation of all the nuance in, in the work that goes on in this industry is an important part of showing the value in a, in a credible way. So, um, and also the standards that we're working on, we feel like are enablers for a whole bevy of other infrastructure that are important in supporting an efficient industry, namely ratings, agencies, verification processes, and other uh, analytic tools. Um, and so just a little bit of extra background, IRIS really is a set of standards analogous to something like financial accounting reporting standards. It's a library of terms that um, are agreed upon through a collaborative process with an advisory body and a governance structure so that at the end of the day we try to produce and deliver a, an objective set of definitions that everybody can use and speak the same language when they're talking about things. Right now we often find that one person says full-time employees and another says full-time employees and they mean totally different things and somebody else says employees and somebody else says em full-time employees and they also mean to uh, they mean the same thing. And so if we don't try to create a common way to describe things and to report on them, then we can't derive an understanding of our impact in a consistent way. Great. So I just want to turn to, to Patty. That's, I mean, I hope that sort of makes sense. But just to ask you, so you were at Root Capital and you are adopters of the IRIS standards. Could you just be quite practical and explain <coughs> what that means? What does it mean for you to adopt IRIS and why, again, for you from the perspective of a financial services company that's trying to do what you do, why is IRIS useful? Sure, so I'll just give a quick background on what Root Capital does. We're a nonprofit social investment fund and we um, provide capital and also financial training to grassroots businesses. Um, in rural areas, so mainly coffee, cocoa, agricultural cooperatives and businesses in Latin America and Africa. And so we are both an, invest, an investee because we're an intermediary fund as well as an investor because we invest in the small and growing businesses. Um, and so as IRS adopters, several years ago we started tracking different metrics to look at our outcomes and determine things like how many farmers are in our portfolio, um, what the revenue growth is over time, what the income changes over time are. And we collected a lot of different metrics and had even internally different definitions for, for some of them, like the, the employment one is a good example. And so as IRIS adopters, we agreed and were part of the process of coming up with the coming up with the metrics, but agreed upon these as common metrics. And so it's helped us both internally with our own investment officers to articulate what um, kind of metrics we're collecting and then what that means for our impact, as well as externally with other investors and our colleague organizations, so other organizations that are investing in, in small and growing businesses. Um, and, and, we've, um, and so and part of that has been to adopt a common platform to, to put the data in and then um, we can benchmark against that um, each other eventually. And imagining that this works for Root, what is Root's vision of the difference it would make in your business five years from now if both your participation in IRIS is successful and IRIS as an initiative takes off? I think that it could mean 
I think it's easier to collaborate with our colleague organizations if we're all speaking the same language and we all know what we're talking about when we talk about um, beneficiaries or, um, or, or employment or sustainable, um, uh, some, around, some around our environmental impact. So I think it, it will help us to, to either do co-investments or other projects with our, with our colleague organizations. And it certainly helps us um, speak to donors better. Um, and so instead of, like you say, explaining sort of the, the space and explaining, um, giving so much background on, on what we do in terms of anecdotes, we can give a quicker synopsis of what we do and people sort of get on the same page quickly and can, and can, tr and can judge us on that. That's great. So Diego, this all sounds great, but making money is hard, saving the world is hard. A lot of people are trying to now make money and save the world and now you're being told in addition you've got to track social metrics and standards. Isn't it just a distraction from your day job to have to go and, and be tracking metrics when all you're trying to do is just survive? Well, but to change the world, you're going to measure it as you measure your, your financials. So, so if I basically agree with all the ideas that, that you, you were um, presenting. Um, the reality is, uh, in, in our case, um, we measure it all the time. Like, although we have like a very distinctive measures, we are um, sorry. Interruption is a fair trade um, developer and marketer of uh, fair trade and organic farmers in Latin America. Um, we work with several countries in Latin America with different realities, and uh, um, the way we measure um, the social impact in the short term um, is basically with the amount of money that gets invested in social concrete projects that could be divided into education, health, uh, housing environment and creating a more sustainable job um, context. Um, so that number for us is very important. It's usually around 10% of our sales. This year we're going to be around $8 million in sales. It's going to be around $800,000 in direct money that goes back to the community that before when producers were producing conventional farming were not receiving. So, and that basically can increase um, the benefits of a farmer between 50 and 100% extra income. So it's a very concrete uh, measurement that we use. Um, and on the long term, we have uh, on also on the quantitative, each, each of, the, of that money goes into different fund, funds, and each fund has its own um, long-term criteria to measure. It. Obviously, in education, for example, the, the amount of uh, years that a child from a farmer's family is going to study, even after 10 years, if increased, Great, that's, that's one of our metrics. Uh, on our health programs, um, the, the amount of people that can access the benefits of our, we have a medicament, uh, a drug uh, plan where they can buy drugs that are prescribed from, from, from doctors that maybe they cannot afford and we reimburse them. So the amount of beneficiaries of that program uh, would be another, or the number of people that get sick in a community of, of a more ideal. We don't measure everything, but we do have the, the standards that imply on that. And the same well, with um, housing and environment and, um, and, and job conditions. Um, so that's, a, that's a, for me a very important distinction between the long term, because when you talk about social things, you have to put the social in the mind, because if not, all that you do is buy um, sneakers or things like that. that actually, are, that's part of a great part of the investments are usually in that or uh, uh, things that uh, are basic needs, um, but are not not um, not implied with or, or do not correspond with a larger social impact or low for trade standards demand that there must be the decision is them theirs no so sometimes you have into that like that they choose to invest the funds in in a portfolio of social projects that should have an public impact that are not exactly what you would consider from a technical point but in the end like they're right so or, or whatever no so but but uh, that part is I think the part that you cannot really measure is like trying to measure how efficient is a voter when they elect Obama or crazy Republicans in my opinion. I'm sorry for <laughs> bias <laughs> but um, but it, that's that's where you touch a thing that is difficult but there are a lot of concrete measurements that are proxies because also financials and accounting is a proxy of the economic reality uh, that you can use and on the other side I've been talking about the quantity side and the amount of money and, and special indicators. You have the standards that for us are very important in, in our whole strategy of existence and our branding strategy. 
um, because you, you and we do mostly fruits and vegetables, and on the fruits and vegetables, as in the cereals and grains and oils, in the food industry you have markets and prices. So um, we work the first year with producers with uh, good agricultural practices as a minimum enter, enter, entry and some social responsibility indicators that we created. On the second year, they have to meet with international fair trade standards are measured by a third party that is called the FLO or IMO, that are two fair trade certifiers. Uh, and on the third year, they uh, usually become organic certified after a three-year transition. That it, that's also certified and audited by the international organic standards um, on, on the environmental side on, on organic farmers, on the use of pesticides and all that. Um, so basically, there we have like a path towards like a, a larger impact or public and social and environmental impact that implies complying with standards. Where well, there, there's no so much uh, maybe quantitative measure, but yes, there's a rating. And that's why we have interruption sustainability that is our base level one that implies like almost zero social value added. And you have fair trade that is level two that is usually priced at market plus 10%. Then you have uh, the third level that is fair trade and organic that is usually priced at between 20 and 40% above the market. And uh, in the future, we want to incorporate like renewable energies and, yeah. and other impacts. So it sounds like just from that that there's one constituency that cares is you have buyers who will pay you a premium if you can show that you have measured and performed certain processes to get to those the consumers. levels. In terms of especially the question of quantitative to qualitative, I just want to turn to you, Patty, and say there's a lot of people who don't need things measured. They just need nice stories and nice photos. So why isn't that good enough? I mean, why couldn't Root Capital reach its goals if all you did was every quarter send a nice story and a nice photo? Um, why do you need to measure things, and especially why do you need to quantify them? Well, we have a whole internal process that needs to look at that to really understand where, because we have a social mission, how we're reaching that. And I think part of that is being really articulate and thinking through, being deliberate on where we hope to have impact. And so measuring those things that make sense to our own kind of logic model, we think about that a lot and it's kind of the academic exercise in some ways. And um, But it, it really is important for us to identify exactly where we think we're having the greatest impact and then identify what those metrics from the IRS taxonomy we choose like a menu. Sorry, just to interrupt, but is that something that's self-motivated? You said you have an internal team. Are there constituencies that are crucial for you to grow your business? It, absolutely. Who also yeah. asking for yeah, it, are donors. I, I mean, I think more and more the, the donors um, focus on that, I, the big donors that are um, the sophisticated donors that we're we're trying to engage with want us to measure it, and they they need the context as well. So stories are always important, and case studies are important. But um, it's definitely driven internally, and then certainly externally, because there's a huge movement in the the impact investing space, and you particularly <laughs> are are one of the the ones that are that are pushing it, and and it coincides sort of with the way we look at our portfolio. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, just a similar question around Iris as a system. I mean, who cares about those standard metrics now, and who do you need to care for Iris to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I think I think people like Patty care, and I think the there are a lot of people who are investors in the space because they genuinely want to have positive impact. And I guess there's that famous quote that goes, "A pile of anecdotes doesn't equal data." And so there's um, obviously a need to look at data to make sure that they're working towards and achieving the progress they want to achieve. And then I. I just came back from a conference where a lot of people were talking about on the investor side the importance of transparency in order to understand both their, you know, the burden of proof is there to demonstrate that they are doing what they say they're doing. And if these types of investment opportunities are going to exist and be described in a way that uh, orients them around an impact um, mandate, then they, then there's a you know, an obligation to show that with data and and to back it up. And, and so I think increasingly what IRIS needs to go from an A standard that uh, field builders and, and true believers in the space are using to something that everybody uses is more investors who, you know, feel accountable to have that kind of transparency and, and as more investors send demand signals to, to, to Patty and, and to Diego, then we will see that these data become, you know, best practice. So if that's going to happen, Diego, I suspect you have one fear, which is the signals that are sent are going to be, we need things to be tracked that are so rigorous and onerous that it actually makes it hard for you to run your business and grow it. On one hand. On the other hand, 
If things are so easy to measure, then your competitors who don't go to the effort you go to, to actually make sure you do a social impact, will be able to get away with saying they're as impactful as you are. So how do you find the right balance? And if Sarah's saying there's a group of investors who are about to set this new set of demand signals, what would you say to them about what expectations they should have and how do you find the right needle between being too onerous on one hand or too superficial on the other? Well, um, I'm 100% inclined to the way that you need to measure the social metrics. We do. Um, in the case of farming, I think it's different with the rest of the industries because this, this, the standards are very clear. On the environmental side, it's organic farming. On the social side, it's fair trade. There's not, not much doubt about it. There's some retailers that want to do like ethics and things like that, but the standards are very clear and they're tough. Um, we're seven people in our organization, me and three people that do sales and, and relate to uh, retails and three people that relate to producers and work on that metrics all day. And that's what they do and they work on the, all, all the labor conditions uh, on, on one place, on the food safety, uh, food safety, worker safety, um, impact. That it's a, a very basic um, and, and part of our vision to do that, and, and if not also, we wouldn't be able to, to market, to, to certify, because you need the third party certifier. So maybe in, in our industry, it's very clear that you must do it. It takes a lot of jobs. You look at the folders of each association of producers, they're like, uh, they're a bit excessive sometimes, but I, I believe it, uh, in order, you, you, you sometimes need to be some a bit exaggerated in order to really make a difference between what's, um, audit and, and real and something that it's not. But I think also that it depends a lot on the industry. If you don't have to guarantee that kind of impact to a consumer or to an investor or donor or whatever, maybe some organizations, it's a waste of time. No? In, my, in our case, I think it's more important, but mm -hmm. on our organizations, it might not and be zero import, zero percent import. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're a seven person firm that has three people basically focused on certifications and measurement. Yeah. And so I suspect there are not a lot of successful mm -hmm. firms out there, startups in mainstream capitalism that have three out of seven or 40% of their staff focused on this. I mean, Sarah, is, is Iris, if it's successful five years from now and it really takes off, it becomes a standard you talk about, will that help Diego reallocate some resources? Will he be able to be as effective in measuring social impact without having to put 42% of his staff into it? <laughs> but, sorry, but, uh, just to be clear, this 42% uh, <laughs> they're not working just to comply with the certifiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really creating the social impact, no? And, yeah. uh, and the association. Okay, no, I, so I, I, I it's hear not you. just the metrics, but the creation but I of the social impact. I suspect if it's even more impact. than 2 or 3%, it's... No, no, okay. But you know, it could be, not the, just Sarah could help you out. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to help him out? Uh, no, but I mean, I think that point he makes is a good one, that the, the business in of itself has a social orientation and so the work that the people are doing, whether there's a data collection component to it or it's just... Um, you know, that happens as part of the activities of their daily, you know, tasks is, is, I think that's the kind of consistency that we hope exists with the way people use the measures and the way their, their work uh, objectives are. I mean, I think what you are highlighting is the tension between, like, what's feasible to measure and what would be required to measure to really prove that business activities are correlated with, you know, poverty alleviation or improve, improvements in health. Um, but I think that and there's more to be done there to demonstrate that the relationship between some of the things that are in IRS are, in fact, um, tied to these broader you know, economic improvements we want to see in, in certain parts of the world. But I, I think that the way that IRS is most effective and the way that people find value in it across from, from investor to investee is, is if the outputs people are tracking are tied to their mission and their progress towards them is just as important to them as their financial progress. And so they set targets and they measure things and that works towards achieving their goals. Mm -hmm. And then Patty, do you have a sense of that balance? Um, and is the current metrics debate getting to a balance which is right or is it too onerous or too easy? I think the, the IRS metrics themselves are... Um, they're, they're collectible and they're helpful and they sort of, we can collect them for our whole, our whole portfolio of 200 businesses and we can track progress over time. They're one um, group of data that it feeds into our broader impact assessment. So we do deeper case studies looking at um, how gr growth of enterprises over time, how our loans have affected that. Um, and that's another sort of data point that we use to identify our entire social impact. We're also looking at doing household, we're going to be doing next year household surveys, so we're looking at, um, at the household 
level impacts of what we're doing, and that will be a more academic study. We can't do many of those because they're just hugely expensive, and we have, but we have a donor that wants us to do them, and it's data that we, we'd love to have because we can use it to inform our own operations, and certainly people like to hear about uh, whether it's a randomized control trial or something with some kind of counterfactual that we can present to people that's, that's interesting to donors and helpful for us internally. So it's, it's a balance, um, but I think kind of poking at it from different angles is, is a way to get somewhat of a, a close picture of, of what we're doing. That's great. Um, so question for the three of you is, where is this all going? Um, I mean, where do you think, I guess I'll start by saying, where do you want all of this to be in five years for your business, for the initiative, or for for Root as a nonprofit, and, and then what is it going to take to get there? Um, and I'll specifically on the last question ask you to sort of say to this audience, how would you, um, you know, what can the people in this room do that's, that's most relevant to sort of pushing this forward? Um, and maybe we'll do a little poll. Uh, so what, sorry, we'll do a quick poll. So how many of you are currently students? Um, so how many of you, so those who are not students, how many of you are currently running either nonprofits or for-profits who you think could you know, use a metric system that gets developed. Um, and how many of you are sort of in the position to put money to work to support uh, these kinds of things? Okay, so uh, that's a good sense of sort of who's here. So I guess the question for them and for you guys is, you know, what's your vision for where this could be in five years? What difference would that make in your organization? And what can this sort of group do to get engaged in, in making that happen? Any of you? I think um, externally, I think there's, a real thirst for this kind of data from, from investors and donors. And so helping investors and donors identify where their resources are best spent is a great goal. And I think in five years, if we're close to that, that's a really, um, Anthony will have done his job certainly and, and we'll all be better off because there'll be more capital flowing into the space. Um, and then internally and um, for the way we run our own business, I think the better the data quality, the better the analysis, the better our services are for our for our borrowers, and so the better, the further along we'll be in in, in um, achieving our mission of of, of um, alleviating poverty. So. Um, I, again, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but I I spent a few years of, in a former life working in the online advertising industry when it was first emerging, and there was a series of challenges that industry face in terms of getting legitimacy from the traditional mainstream advertisers around how do they demonstrate what kind of ads they, sh like how many ads they've shown, what the ROI on the advertising campaign is, and all these established mes metrics that exist in proving the value of a dollar, whether you believe that exists or not, were around and allowing the advertising industry and traditional mediums to thrive and, and be very um, uh, established and then the as the online advertising industry emerged there were all sorts of new tools and new players doing things in fragmented ways and it took and it's still evolving but it took buy-in and commitment from the people that had the most authority in the space to say we're going to give up some of our um, perceived differentiation based on our own proprietary modes in order to come and support the idea that as a whole will be more effective in getting more dollars to our space and I think that's what's really needed in in this field there this industry has been around for a while in, in fragments and as there's a movement to make it more coherent it takes commitment on the parts of the individual players to to support a collective vision even if it means change from what they've been doing well uh, before the um, the conference I was talking to Pepe Morales that he, ha he was talking about uh, it would be great if there was something there would be something like in the social world like the carbon credit market, um, the, a mechanism, a market mechanism that could internalize the ex negative externalities that poverty are, is, basically, and the, the creation of poverty, uh, at least in countries like Argentina, it's, it's, it's like something that's growing and it's new. There used to be much less poor people and they used to be better conditions, so it's somebody's been generating that. Obviously, the state is very much involved, but this, this idea of, of, a, of a public law for that, I think, would be great. And from the private sector, uh, and especially this, the industry, I think, and the first question that you were referring from Yunus, uh, which is one of my guides since for 10 years now, um, it's that, that for Yunus to be right, that, that is right, I think that's the ideal world, and that's the, but that for that, you have to be subject to pricing risk at zero. 
because uh, the only way you can give zero returns to a shareholder is that you give them close to zero risk. And I think the price of risk in the industry is really like what, what makes a difference and what uh, can really make a lot of money come into the sector because I think it has to go much, much faster and there's much more money needed. And for that, you have to be a, have a, a, an efficient way of pricing risk and social risk and, and resolving that issue no? in, the, in five years from now. Yeah. So I'll open up for questions in a second, but before we do that, I don't want this to be another good news story about how social enterprise is easily changing the world. So I want you guys to take the same question. I just asked you, how is it all going to work out? How is this all going to go horribly wrong? <laughs> so how is all this excitement about metrics and measuring impact going to, on one hand, destroy your business, and the other hand, make you really unhappy? So what are the big, you talk about risk on the financial side, what are the big risks about the enthusiasm of people in this room to spend beautiful Friday afternoons talking about metrics? How could that be really bad for the work we do and for the institutions you work in as well? So I think if it, if it, if it, hides the nuance of what we're all doing and tries to boil everybody down to a few numbers, I think you, I think there's a risk of, of kind of a race to the, the most basic data without, without putting on your own preferences and thinking through sort of the, the business model and the, and then just the basic social impact that you're, you're hoping to have. I think it really needs to be um, one one data point in, in different um, ways to measure the same impact, but one kind of good and trackable measures are helpful, but certainly there needs to be the qualitative side of things. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think there's always a risk with data that you create perverse incentives, and I, I think that's a challenge that has existed for a long time. And, and when people talk about getting rewarded in the nonprofit space for just getting more and more people using their services when getting more people to come may mean that they're scaling faster they can deliver quality services. And so I think the, you know, the, in order for these data and the use of these data to have the integrity we want them to have to have this industry do the things it has the potential to do, we, we really have to manage the gaming of, of data. Relevance. I think if we're, this is not relevant for the society, you know, like uh, there's a culture challenge. Like, um, the, the group of people that are mind have social enterprises and the social impact and environmental impact in New York is a lot, but in the, wor in the world it's still very little. And um, so it needs to be some kind of culture change that is beyond, I think, the <laughs> conversation. But, but if all can go wrong if, if we are not relevant. If what we do if from other parts is too small and doesn't affect reality. You know? yeah, so I think it needs to be relevant, it needs to be reliable, and it shouldn't be reductionist. I think that's what you're hearing from the panel. Um, you know, we, I, I have a friend named John Goldstein who's the founder of Imprint Capital, and he has a great line where he says, you know, we have to make sure that impact investing is neither too hard nor too easy. And I think that's, again, about the balance. If it's, if it's too easy, if these actually aren't reliable, if people can just tell stories and claim they're making impact when they actually aren't, or if they can do it in a way that's not audited, then it, this will fail because lots of people will say they're having an impact and they won't. Um, but it also could become too hard. If, the burdens that are put on the people in this panel and many of you um, are such that they're not actually relevant to whether you are making a difference or not, and yet they become the hoop you have to jump through in order to have the right to operate. Then doing this work will become too hard, and, and it's finding that balance. Um, but I think one cautionary word that I'm hearing from you, you're probably all too polite to say it, is you're not going to find that balance if the balance is determined by people who spend their time going to social enterprise conferences. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, that's one of the problems is those of us who are, have jobs and have fascination with this topic, as you say, are not the ones who are going to have to use these standards and really take them to scale. Um, so I think it's an interesting, uh, good set of cautionary tales. I just wanted to open up for questions. We'll take a few at a time and then um, ask the panel to respond. <coughs> um, do they need to be on mics? We have a couple of okay. Um, I guess, can you just hand it around? Yeah, so maybe start over here. Um, and then do you want to start over here? Thank you. I'm Cynthia Simon. I'm a graduate student at SEPA. And I wanted to ask you, have you do you have an idea of uh, the cost that collecting this data adds to um, the ventures, and just perhaps roughly? And also, I'm a bit suspicious about whether this data is actually available. I have a feeling that I know in, in many nonprofit organizations, 
collecting this data is extremely difficult, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why it isn't done or isn't done very, very well. And in many of the kinds of countries in which you're talking about investing, the data isn't available or it's very difficult to get. So I, I would ask you to address both of those issues, the, the cost that it's adding and even whether the data is really available. And I'm, and I'm not familiar with the kinds of data so much that you're, so, so maybe I'm talking about different kinds of data, but. Okay, great. So a question around the cost and the, and the um, just, you know, maybe Wall Street just mentioned what, you know, where more information on these systems can be found. Um, but sorry, question over here. A director of a social enterprise and a first year student at Yale SOM. Uh, I apologize beforehand for asking a question that the panel may not be able to answer and for speaking in business terms. Uh, but it seems like the entire point of collecting this data is so that uh, we could better allocate uh, the limited resources we have in terms of donations or, or dollars towards social causes. Um, in that sense, it seems like it's a zero sum game in, in, in one respect. And my question is, who are the losers from adding transparency to the process? Because obviously if we have a limited source of funds, it's being allocated in a certain way now, and the data will inherently change our behavior. Who's gonna lose in that process? Okay, great, so uh, one more and then I'll ask the panel to, yep. My name is UC Terrell with UNH, uh, where we're starting a center for social enterprise in a very early stages. My question is around long-term impact and uh, it, the, the difficulty in measuring that. It's most obvious in education, if you work with elementary or middle school students, trying to put them on a trajectory to go to college, graduate from college, and a single organization is not going to be given the, the time or the resources to do that tracking. So in the field of social impact measurement, how are you looking to academia and to other research institutions to provide the, the studies that will help a, um, an organization um, make its case that its short-term output is really going to have long-term impact with an individual or a community? Great, so three questions. One is around the costs of adopting these kind of systems, and I would add, um, what is the opportunity cost of not doing it? Because I think we should talk about costs and opportunity costs together. The second question is around who are the losers in the system? I think it's a great question. There's also an embedded assumption in the question, which is that there is a zero-sum a situation that any dollar you spend or time you spend measuring impact is time you are not allocating elsewhere. I just wanted to see if the panel agrees with that assumption. And then on this question of long-term impact, I, mean, I think there's two questions again. One is, how do you determine what the long-term impact is and are you engaging academics? But I think the broader question is, what can we actually measure at the enterprise level? Um, because many of the social changes we seek are around the change in systems. And is it realistic to actually use the enterprise as the unit of analysis when trying to understand social change? So I made three questions, six questions, and leave it to any of you to answer them. Any one or any one of the six or all of them. Um, well, regarding the costs, in our case, and I think in a lot of organizations' case, it's a one-time thing. It's putting the systems in order. Um, we incur everything we measure, it's the, the people that measure is the people that do it, and it doesn't take time if we have online systems for everything that we pay 19.95 to to QuickBooks Online and $5 a year to Google, and that's it. And um, But you have to have the correct procedures manual and, and the systems, and uh, that's very much related, I think, to the third question of the academia. Like, academia, I think, should add institutions. Like, what we need is new institutions, new set of rules uh, for what we want to measure and how we're going to create it. And there's institutions and rules that work for social organizations and things that you measure that don't. So what are you going to measure? Like, that kind of guidance on a detailed level, I think we need support from, from the, like, a social institute of technology or something like that. Um, and, and those are real technologies because these rules change uh, realities and, and how you set and how you, how you spend the money. So I think um, we would have a lot of support from, from the academia. And if I can answer my own, so my own opinion, I think it's not a zero-sum game. I think it's uh, the winners currently are companies like Dole or McDonald's that are, in, are included in some of the social you know, dominant 400 index or on part of the SRI. Uh, and uh, there would be clear uh, measurements of social investments. A lot of those companies will, will not be in those funds and that money would go to companies that have a real impact. So, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with it. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think part of why I believe in building 
a framework and standardization around these metrics is because they think that that credibility and the use of these data will make this a more compelling field for more people to invest in. And I, and I think the question about who loses in the transparency is also um, not obvious because I think just like now people see tracking their financial performance as a core part of running a business. I think if we can change the paradigm so people see these data as an important piece of how they plan and, and manage their operations, then, then the value will be that the customers will be better served and everybody will, who's involved with the businesses or benefiting from the businesses will, will, will reap, the value, reap the benefits. Um, on the availability of data question, I think that, you know, and I can answer probably the long-term impact question alongside that. And, and from the IRS point of view, there's a uh, sort of the framework stops at outputs. And so a lot of the measures that we want people to track in a consistent way are things that are probably easy for them to track if they're aligned with their social objectives. So if they care about targeting very poor customers and they care about giving them access to water, those are things that they should probably have targets for and be trying to track. I think that question about how that relates to whether those customers have a reduced morbidity level and, and reap other productivity benefits or things that very much the academic sphere could help provide extra resources and, and capacity to evaluate. And I think there's, a, as I said earlier, this need to be mindful of the feasibility with the real desire to understand the counterfactual and, and the proof. And so I think the academic sphere has a lot to offer this space and, and to helping us feel confident that we are measuring things that matter in, in capturing some of these other data points. Yeah, and as Sarah said, uh, for us, certainly, we're collecting this data as part of our processes. So um, the additional cost is, is almost nothing, if not nothing. And, but as we kind of want more information and engage with academics and want to do deeper studies, then the costs go up and suddenly we're a lender that, that requires a lot more information from our borrowers, and that, that is something we think about a lot, and kind of our own competitiveness, um, just making sure that we're not overloading them with requests. But at the moment, the basic data we collect as a matter of uh, our, our loan application process, and then, um, and then it's important if we do a deeper study in, in conjunction with academics or on our own, that we share that with them, with the borrowers, that, so that it has some value to them, and that we engage with them from the beginning so that it has value to, for them. Just to quickly just pick up on that, I think those of us who care about this industry growing have an obligation to help make the cost-benefit analysis on the margins better and more attractive for people who we seek to encourage to adopt. And I think there's two things we can do, and you've sort of heard both sides. One is, what can we do to ensure that there actually are benefits to those people who adopt standards? And I think the benefits should come from new sources of capital that will be more inclined to seek to put their money to work for those people to track impact. I think that's the way you can make the benefit increase. And then I think a lot of us are working on infrastructure projects to reduce the cost. Um, you've heard a lot about IRIS. There's another one called Pulse. I don't know if anyone from Pulse was here uh, in this conference, but Pulse is basically a piece of software developed with support of Google and others that is a piece of software that's, that a firm now, a nonprofit or a for-profit can buy. Um, and that allows you to have a built-in, ready-to-go turnkey system for how you measure and track the social impact of what you do. I think that's one way to reduce the costs. The other very important way is around shared infrastructure. A lot of the costs that Wall Street, Wall Street has driven down their costs of doing things like bond underwriting, partly because of pieces of shared infrastructure, like Moody's and S&P and others, where there are third-party ratings agencies who have the expertise in how to rate risk um, the fact that you're all nodding your heads is a sign of the times. If I said that a year ago, everyone would have snickered. Um, but when these things work, they work. And what they do is they enable people to really become expert at ratings, in that case, risk. I think in our field, um, there's a new initiative called GEARS, the Global Impact Investment Rating System, that is going to be a third-party ratings agency so that not every firm has to rebuild the capabilities to do this themselves. All, a lot of the costs come from people having to build these systems themselves and all the duplication that's going on. I think if we as an industry get together and create more of the shared services capabilities without being, you know, naive about it, it's not saying people are going to have to come together and coordinate. It's the natural way that industries evolve. Um, I think that'll make a big difference. Ultimately, the game here, and some of you heard me say this before, is that we need the marginal dollar that is seeking to make a difference to be put in the hands of the best problem solvers and not just the best storytellers. Um, and that's, I think, another way to get around the zero sum question. This is about putting the resources we do have, and it's about growing them, 
and then it's about taking the ones that are there and making them more effective. At the end of the day, it could very well be that the greatest losers of an effective metric system are the people who right now are telling much better stories than they are solving problems. Um, but that's okay as long as the industry survives. Um, you know, Alvaro Rodriguez from Ignea makes the point that most industries, the companies that we now buy our cell phones and our t-shirts and our cars from didn't exist when the industry started. But the idea that those industries existed and pre created utility, that has what's, that's what stayed along. And I think this industry, those of us who care about solving social problems, will be much better off in a world in which we are measuring and able to convey what it is that we do, even if the particular players come and go. Um, so just a, we have time for quite a few more questions. Um, where are the mics? Um, so maybe over here in the purple dress. And on that side, is there? Yeah, we'll go there next. As if this wasn't. Sorry, could you say who you are and where you're from? Yes, I can. Thank you. My name is Laura Rosen, and I am a CBS alum from way back when, before we had all these really cool clubs like Social Enterprise. Um, my question is this. The emergence of the randomized controlled studies uh, gave rise to a debate in the industry about um, rather, whether there really is a longer term impact, whether there is a social impact, particularly as regards microfinance and women. Um, that was one of the examples. So as if this wasn't hard enough to actually measure this stuff, now you have people fighting about it and it's created conflict in the industry. So my question to you is how, how is that going to be overcome? Because you essentially have people one side of the of the debate saying it's got to be measurable, it's got to be something, and the other side saying you can't measure the things that truly are having an impact, and you can't if you're measuring it, you can't take a long enough cycle in order to be able to really see the impact. So, how are we going to overcome the actual debate um, to really get somewhere? Okay, so not necessarily what their points of view are on the debate, but how are we going to move the debate from debate to something productive? Uh, great. Any sorry over here. Um. Hi. My name is Marta, I'm a graduate student from SIPA, Colombia. And my question is, well, uh, I see, I find measuring impact, social impact is very difficult, but I think each social enterprise can, is finding their way to measure the social impact they are creating. Don't you think the issue is more really about how to compare this KPI that they are de developing? And I'd like to ask you, how far are we from finding any kind of tool of, for rating and comparing from different social enterprises, that for sure would be very, would be very compelling to, for potential social investors to, to join this industry. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. So the question around comparability, which I think is linked to the first question as well. Um, sorry, uh, over here. I just wanted him to. Hi, I'm Dan Blumberg. I'm getting my MBA at uh, Baruch College downtown. Uh, first, I just want to just disagree with one thing that you said, Anthony, about um, storytellers being the biggest losers. And they're not going to lose unless the people with the metrics are telling just as good stories, because yeah. the story always wins, um, speaking as a former journalist. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question I had is about um, the demand for these metrics. Um, Patricia, you said that donors more and more are, are asking for these types of metrics, but um, in studies that I've read, uh, particularly the Money for Good uh, white paper that I read recently, I think they boil it down to basically about 3% of donors are looking for um, impact metrics, and the majority of people who even do any research before they give are really just looking to validate their choice of charity that they've already made. So I'm just curious, uh, uh, how much demand you really see out there and when you see it turning a corner of more people really um, requiring these types of metrics. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And just to be clear, the best world will be one in which the best problem solvers are the best storytellers. Um, I totally agree with you. Uh, it'll be an interesting world in which the storytellers aren't the best problem solvers but still get all the money, um, which some people might say is the world we live in. But so on the three questions I think they are related is how are we going to overcome an internal debate about what is the right level of measuring uh, value, um, which I think is linked to the question of, um, you know, whether it's the storytellers or the number crunchers um, who will win. And then, and then the question around comparability, which I think we haven't talked enough about on this panel, that the, the power of metrics once they allow us to uh, enable comparison and benchmarking. So again, anyone have any thoughts on those? One or all of them? I'll speak to the, the question. Um, 
that was just posed on the on the demand for the for the information. I think that, if I'm not mistaken, that that study was focused on individual donors. Is that true? Yeah, high net worth. So, um, so the world that I work in more is around with foundations and corporations, some individuals as well, but um, certainly the foundations, the Gates and Rockefellers of the world, um, do focus on on metrics. And and I think that individual donors, they ask for the metrics, um, and they may. I think they read them to varying degrees of, of depth, but um, I think it's it's certainly asked for. Um, but I but in the foundation and and corporation world, it's it's pretty well um, you know putting forth milestones and really articulating w what metrics you're going to hit is is something we are um, are encouraged to do um, all constantly. I guess on the ending the debate, I'm not sure that the debate will end or needs to end. I, I mean, I feel, I mean, financial accounting reporting standards, not to abuse the analogy, still are opined about and people talk about, mm, offer opinions about better ways to measure things and, you know, how scientific research is conducted is something that continues to evolve and, and be refined. And so I think that if there is a lot of energy and enthusiasm about how to continue to refine practices around these measurements, I think that's hopefully in the best interest of the community because it says there's a value and a need to continue to understand it and do it better. Um, on the comparability piece, I think um, one of the reasons that I, IRIS was funded or the premise under which it was funded was that the, and, and is being built, was that the collection of underlying consistent data points would allow for the creation of rating systems. And there are certainly a lot of players in the space who want deep uh, analytics and many data points about individual organizations and their performance, but there are many who are just looking for a three-star, four-star rating in a social screen in a way to say that um, this is a good investment. And I think the ratings agency that Anthony mentioned, the Global Impact and Rate Investing Rating System, is a first attempt to build that, and they are going to be piloting their tool next year, and so hopefully it'll be available more broadly soon. Um, well, I think if, if the social objective is clear, um, the way to, to, to measure it is not that, that more that, that complicated. No? I think a, a lot of times the problems that organizations have are, are the, because of the, the social objective is not clear. So from there comes clearly all the rest of the metrics. And That's great. So before we let you guys go, we started a little late, so Pepe told me you could run a few more minutes. Um, I want to ask everyone in the panel, as a way of conclusion, in one minute, Ask the question you wish you had been asked and either answer it yourself or get someone else on the panel to answer it. <laughs> so what were you hoping that they would have said and maybe the next question would have been this question. Um, what do you think is important? What's the question that, needs to, that this kind of panel needs to consider? Um, and either what's your answer or maybe you're intrigued to hear what someone else has to say. Um, how do we measure environmental impacts in a cost-effective way? I don't know. <laughs> if anyone does know, she'll be here afterwards. Um, uh, I just, I'm, not, I'm surprised people didn't ask, how can I find out more about Iris and where do I get started? <laughs> we have Did a website. website? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, not to evangelize, but uh, uh, iris.thegin.org. The two I's and the gin. And with a G. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the t shirt, which will be up here afterwards. <laughs> where do you get the t shirt? That's the other question. <laughs> Um, how can I help? That would be a good one. <laughs> uh, and basically, um, one is by being responsible consumers, very important. As for interruption for trade products in your supermarket, that's a big demand. And um, also, like, um, funding for this is very important for all, all these projects. Uh, Root Capital is one of our founder, uh, funders and the most important one. And there are not many organizations that like Root Capital around. And those great organizations doing great stuff and just right. get involved. <laughs> right. Well, I just want everyone just to reflect for a second the fact that we're sitting in the Rune Arledge Cinema, um, having a conversation at Columbia Business School at a conference attended by 500 people about social impact. Uh, it's pretty remarkable, and it's a field that's growing incredibly quickly. It's amazingly dynamic. On the question of how you can help, um, I'm not so naive as to think that all of you are going to graduate from business school and 
jump into working for nonprofits, but there are many more ways available for all of you to participate, whether it's as a consumer, um, as a consumer of both goods that you pay for and information that comes from organizations like Patty's. Um, it's an incredibly exciting world to be in, and just thank everyone for their interest and thank the panel for a very provocative conversation. Thank you.